The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome to The David Pakman Show. We are live on YouTube. Hi to everyone watching from the We Survive Bush, you survive, oh, You'll Survive Obama Facebook page, as well as the I Love It When I Wake Up in the Morning and Barack Obama is President page. Tonight is the third of three presidential debates. Barack Obama will be there. Mitt Romney will be there. Jill Stein will probably not be there unless she wants to get arrested once again. Jill Stein, who is the Green Party presidential candidate, showed up at Hofstra University for the second presidential debate. She tried to enter the debate grounds and she was arrested along with her running mate, Sherry Hancala. We have some video and audio of this, of the arrest. It was a very peaceful, nonviolent arrest, but it is certainly representative of a really significant problem, which we're going to delve into in a second here. Let's take a look and a listen at this. We want to get into the debates. But you're blocking traffic, we so you refuse to move. Our First All right, gentlemen. Rights. Thank you. Nope. Remove them, bring them back to the front. Yeah, we just stand up and we'll help you. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, ladies. Watch the flag. Please. Thank you, ladies. Who's part of that? Thank you, ladies. Come with us. Just come with us. Thank you. Okay, you guys got to stay you. here. All right, everybody, we're going to ask you to please move back. We're going to get this. All right, so there is the arrest taking place, very casual. It's funny because nobody really even seems to, even the officers realized, well, what are we doing here, arresting these two women? I know we have to do it because it's the, it's the law and we're here as representatives of, of, of law enforcement, but what, what are we doing here, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, I'm just glad no one was kicked in the face, uh, punched in the face, body slammed, maced, or shot. Lieutenant, uh, casual pepper spray cop, Lieutenant John Pike, was seen running up to this arrest, it, completely out of breath, holding two cans of pepper spray, saying, wait, 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 I'm here, I'm here. And they said, sorry, it's too late. Too They're, late, buddy. They've been taken away already. So this, this is, why, why, is, why is Jill Stein not at the debates? The reason she's not at the debates is that according to the rules, uh, rules, of course, which are set by many of the same people who want to maintain the status quo in the, in the two-party electoral system, are that you must be garnering 15% in the national polls in order to participate in these national debates. Now, I started thinking about this. We've seen over the last, I don't know, very long time, presidential elections at the popular vote level tend to see a difference. Of, you know, in other words, the winning margin is sometimes as big as five percentage points. Sometimes it's as small as uh, almost nothing, right? We're talking about a few hundred votes in Florida, for example. When you have a difference-making barometer, uh, when, when the amount of, of votes that it could take to make a difference is between almost zero and 5%, to require five times that, or rather, well, depending on where you're at in that spectrum, three, five, 10, 15 times that, 15% to even be in the debates, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't right. make any sense. Let me give you another example. Let's say we were looking at poison and food and what, you know, we know that there's certain amounts of products that, that, are, that are dangerous in foods. And we said, okay, uh, we've determined that these 10 things, which uh, are potentially harmful if they're in food, are harmful if they exist at more than five parts per million. Fair enough. And then we had the FDA or someone else say, uh, well, you only have to list ingredients that are in there above 50 parts per million. We'd say, hold, hold on a second. Something can be bad for you at five parts per million, and it doesn't even have to be listed unless it's 50 parts per million. A different situation, but it's an analogy which tells us if 2% can make a difference, why do you need for 15% to be in, in the debates? And it goes to further the idea that you're never going to get, and you're never going to get to 15 if you keep people out, right? Yeah. That's that's really what's going on. And that your example actually does happen uh, all the time uh, with food. Sure. And But yeah, I mean everything, everything is stacked against uh, third-party candidates, and it's it's not just uh, it's not just the laws that have been put in place uh, by the people who want to keep things the same. I mean, it's just our culture. It's it's going to be very hard to get any type of change. Well, there's one part of it. We need, we need the third party candidates in the debates, and we hope to have Jill Stein on soon, and hopefully we can talk to her about this. But there's also another part, which is the hesitation to vote for these candidates, because you say, well, hold on. If I'm voting for Jill Stein, my number two option is Barack Obama. So essentially, I'm helping Mitt Romney in this particular election, even if I'm voting for the Green Party. So if they get 5% support, they'll get federal funding next election. You don't want to rely, if, you, if, if your goal in having a third party candidate, if you're on the left, is to have someone more left, or if you're on the right, to have someone more right than the Republican candidate, 
you would be scared or weary of really pushing that because if the other side isn't also pushing somebody, you risk hurting the guy that's at least closer to your views. This is really the paramount problem, isn't it, Natan? Yeah, and I think um, this kind of proves that you know a first-round runoff voting situation would be a lot better, and also to be able to have a second choice. So people could say, for example, uh, my first choice is Jill Stein, but if she doesn't get a plurality, uh, my second choice is Obama and the same on the right. Instant runoff voting would be absolutely what we need in conjunction with more reasonable limits for what it takes to get a third party candidate in. I think, you know, along I don't with think campaign finance reform along with campaign finance reform. But putting that as, aside for a second, I, I don't think if you have 0.5 percent support in national polls, it warrants you necessarily being at the final three presidential debates. However, the, the burden can't be 15. It has to be, I don't know, 4%, 5%. If in an average of national polls, you've got 3, 3 4, 5% support, we've got to talk about some system that allows those people to participate because being on the national stage in the first place is what's going to push them over the 5% they need to get federal funding the next election. It's got to happen. Liz. Right. We if can't continue just, the charade. Yeah, if you're talking just plain numbers too, I mean, 5% of the entire population is pretty substantial. No question about yeah. it. That's not just, uh, uh, you know, me writing in Lewis Motomedy one year. Right. Very, very different. Mm -hmm. We've got to talk about this further. We're going to continue talking about it after the election, no matter who wins, and we hope to have Jill Stein on. Ben Stein, talking about Steins, unrelated. Ben Stein went on Fox News, and he, this isn't the first time he said that we need to raise taxes on the rich to help the economy, but he actually said, I hope I don't get killed given that I'm saying this on Fox News. And of course, he got the, the, the usual question from, I think it's Steve Ducey or one of the people on Fox and Friends. And it was, well, aren't we just spending too much? Ben Stein making an obvious case for what needs to happen here. Take a look. Is the way in which we fix the economy with entitlements, spending, taxes, how do you see it? I, I hate to say this on Fox, I hope I'll be allowed to leave here alive, but I don't think there's any way we can cut spending enough uh, to make a meaningful difference, we're going to have to raise taxes on very rich people, people with incomes of like say two, three, four million a year and up, and then slowly, slowly, slowly move it down. Two fifty a year, that's not a rich person. So you don't think Washington <clears throat> just has a spending I problem? I do not think they just have a spending problem. I think they have partly a spending problem, but they also have a too low taxes problem. And uh, with all due respect to Fox, whom I love like brothers and sisters. Well they that sounds like too let's low. pause it there for a second. It's funny because he's making it clear the reason he's scared to say this stuff is because Fox is so overtly uh, uh, right wing anti taxes on the rich. And nobody's arguing that. In yeah. other words, at no point does, and do either of these three individuals on the couch, Steve Ducey, Brian Kilmeade and, and Gretchen Carlson, they never say, well, what, what do you mean? I mean, we do news. We, we're open to all. They never say that. It's almost like this complicit acceptance that, yeah, it is Fox News and, and we have an agenda here. Yeah. It's great. I love it. Let's continue a little more here from Ben Stein. Sounds like Bull Simpson. It is Bull Simpson. So you agreed with the deficit? Yes, they, they have to cut spending and raise taxes. But they, more they, revenue was brought in during the Bush years than any other time. Well, because the economy grow, grow, is growing during that time, uh, but uh, it, even more revenue would have been brought in if they hadn't cut taxes. I mean, revenue is very largely a function of two things, tax rates and the level of economic activity. The level of economic activity was very high until 2008, so they're bringing in more money. But, actually, but tax revenues actually fell from 2001 to 2002, then they recovered. Right, but so, but the, Ben and you have this great economic mind. I but don't. would they have? Would Your they have? Would economists. the revenues have grown at the rate if the taxes were too high? Well, the evidence is that. Yeah, it's funny. Brian Kilmeade y y says, "Well, Ben, you have a great economic mind." No, he understands really basic stuff. Like if you if rich people pay less on taxes. That's not going to create jobs because they're not going to go out and hire people. A lot of those rich people don't even have businesses. They're living off of investments. And number two, you would still continue to invest even with higher capital gains rates up until the point at which there's a negative return. In other words, if you can have your dollars working for you, remember, the tax is on the gain, not the initial capital. If you can have your dollars, think about your dollars as employees. If your employees, after paying those employees, paying the tax on the gain, your employees are still going to bring you a, a gain the economic uh, 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 incentive is you continue producing because you have a positive marginal revenue there. And you would keep doing it. So this idea, it's, it, it doesn't require a genius or it doesn't require a great economic mind. It requires common sense. That's it. Right. This is great. And they keep trying to, uh, to catch him somehow and to make him admit something that uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, he completely dominates Fox News. I love it. And he's a conservative guy. 
Right. That, that he's a Republican. He's a conservative. He just understands that this, this is a silly way of going about things. Cutting he, taxes on the, on the rich. Come facts. on. Facts are good. Facts are good. And, and I think and, he understands that. I think he does. Hopefully he made it out alive. Yeah. Interesting graph I want to show you because in the last debate we had a lot of talk about uh, surrounding the debate there was talk about gas prices, okay? And we see so much blame assigned to President Obama every time gas prices go up. Of course, when they come back off of those highs, we never hear any credit given to him for that. As we've talked to economist Richard Wolf on this show, the president has very little to do with gas prices. But let's play the game that Republicans are playing, which is that because of the super high gas prices that took place during the Obama administration, we should not reelect him. We need somebody like, I guess, Mitt Romney. How would he lower gas prices? I don't know. I have a graph up here, and I'll describe the graph for you. The graph outlines U.S. retail gasoline prices on a monthly basis. Now, if we look at the highest point here, Lewis, which is right here in 2008, it's actually July of 2008. That is under George W. Bush. And we reached a high of $4.114 per gallon under George W. Bush. If we look for the highest point under President Obama, it's a little further down in 2011, where you see this little peak here near, near the right of the graph. And that was May 2011, $3.96 per gallon. So again, I understand that this is not about the president, but for those making it about the president, you have to admit George W. Bush had way more of a problem with gas prices than President Obama. Again, just numbers here. Numbers uh, are apparently very liberally biased when it comes to the Republican community. Yeah, people really need to be a bit more responsible when, when throwing accusations around. We were, we were not fans of Bush, but we never accused him of, uh, of making gas prices this high. No question about it. Yeah. The debate. Remember the girl who stood up at the second debate? Her name was Catherine Fenton. And she asked the candidates the question about the gender pay gap. If you don't remember her, this is the question that she asked. I want to remind you what that was like. Stay standing. Um, and it's Catherine Fenton uh, who has a question for you. In what new ways do you intend to rectify the inequalities in the workplace? specifically regarding females making only 72% of what their male counterparts earn. Well, Catherine, the, the okay, that was the question. Now, that question, of course, led to Mitt Romney saying he doesn't support the Lilly Led Better Fair Pay Act. It led to Mitt Romney referencing that he has binders full of women. They're just exploding with women. So what happened to this girl, this 24-year-old young lady, who had the audacity to ask about gender inequality, mind you, in public and out loud, without a man telling her it was okay for her to speak. Well, some conservatives didn't like that, Lewis. And as it turns out, the conservative publication, The Free Beacon, which we've cited in the past, published an article with no byline, anonymously published. I guess it was by the entire team there, or maybe for whatever reason, they're not naming who, who the author is, smearing the woman, smearing Catherine Fenton. Typical from the right. And they're actually going as far as to slut-shaming her. They started posting, uh, of course, anonymously under, with no byline, tweets allegedly from Catherine Fenton's Twitter account, which, quote, reveal that purple juice is her choice to get blackout drunk, and she has a history of getting wet at happy hour. So again, personal attacks, ad hominem. Listen, Lewis, uh, it's almost as... Uh, she, she's allowed to just go out there and ask these questions? And nobody's checking out whether she ever uh, drinks alcohol or whether she's ever posted anything on Twitter. It's almost like when Trayvon Martin had once been suspended from school, it kind of justifies that yeah, he was killed. Yeah, because he, had, he like smoked marijuana or something. I, I, exactly, exactly. Hey, listen, Catherine Fenton should be glad men are even letting her vote. How dare she ask a question, Lewis? It doesn't make any sense at all. Madness. The other thing also. It's almost as if someone who strapped a dog to the roof of their car or had multiple affairs and divorced wives while they were sick or had a ranch named after the N-word. Imagine if they were allowed to actually be real candidates on the Republican side. It would be just as crazy as someone having purple juice and then mm, asking a that question. That could never happen. It would never happen no. in this country. No. Real quick, Monday book recommendation made possible in part by A Fashion of Bastards, the best-selling satirical forecast of American politics circa 2015 praised as utterly hilarious, foreboding, and entertaining by Joanna Louise Johnson on Amazon.com. I got a lot of great email, but also some hate mail when I recommended uh, Lady in the Lake. And what other ones did I recommend, uh, Natan, by Raymond Chandler? Um, 
sorry, uh, The Long Goodbye? The Long Goodbye. I recommended yeah. a number of Raymond Chandler books, and I got some emails saying, you can't say he really started the genre. You have to give credit to Dashiell Hammett. So that's what I'm doing here. This is one of my favorites. If you haven't read this, you've got to take a look at The Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett. Certainly in the vein of Raymond Chandler, a little bit different in terms of the style. Fantastic book. You will enjoy it. Doesn't matter if you're more into fantasy or fiction or romance novels as Lewis is or sci-fi or whatever the case may be. The Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett is a fantastic story. It's just a good story. That's all it is. It doesn't matter what the genre is, Lewis. And the movie adaptation is considered one of the uh, one of the greatest movies of all time. I've never seen it. Is that true? I believe Correct. so. Wow, incredible. Let's take a break. On the bonus show today, great stories hosted by Lewis Motomedy. Go to davidpackman.com slash membership and support the show. Plenty more. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to the David Pakman Show. Welcome back to the show. Want to say hello to a new David Pakman Show member. You may not realize this, but there's some evidence that penguins are liberal and are part of a liberal conspiracy to scare people about global warming. You can find out more at liberalbias.com, which makes our membership program possible. John Kirk. John Kirk is a new David Pakman Show member. It's great to have him. No confusion, of course, with Kirk Cameron who I am sometimes accused of looking like, and of course is an extreme religious right-wing guy who we really have no interest in having any involvement with this show. Completely separate situation from John Kirk, who we're actually really thankful for having his membership. Absolutely, yes. Ann Romney went on The View, and it was despicable. What was more disgusting, her joking about the accident in which Mitt Romney drove and led to the death of a woman in France in 1968, or Ann Romney saying that being a Mormon missionary and trying to convert people to Mormonism is equivalent to serving in the military during wartime. Hmm. Well, we'll look at both and you tell me what's more offensive. This is a great article in The Examiner by our friend Lou Collagiovanni from, uh, from The Examiner as well as from the We Survive Bush, You'll Survive Obama page. Ann Romney shows up at The View and she's asked a number of different questions about how long have you and Mitt been married and this and that and you know uh, some, you were separated for a while and Ann Romney talks about when Mitt was in France doing his missionary work and how they didn't see each other and she jokingly says that Mitt actually ended up in the hospital when he was in France which is true and she says it's because he was so broken hearted over not being near Ann Romney. Now let's take a listen to that. Then I'll tell you the reality of the situation. It's pretty horrific. Take a listen. We've been together, what, 43 years That's of right. marriage. That is exceptional. And a bunch of grandkids, as Barbara mentioned. Right. Uh, there was one point, though, I think, that you, did you guys almost break up? Well, not according to Mitt. <laughs> not according to him. No. <laughs> you know, we were separated for a very long time. We, we dated in high school, and then he went to Stanford for a year, and he went on a mission for two and a half years. Right. I didn't see him, really, for like three and a half years. Wow. And during no. that time, um, I was, of course, dating other people and having fun and, and sort of forgetting about Mitt a little bit too much. <laughs> and I think that really kind of hurt him a lot. Ne oh. nearly, nearly put him, I think it actually did put him in the hospital when he was in France. Oh. <laughs> he was utterly heartbroken. Oh. He was hurt. Oh, well, how funny. He put him in the hospital when he was in France. Well, the real reason, it's true. Mitt please, Romney. Please never do that impression again. Mitt Romney was in the hospital when he was in France, Louis. But he was in there not because he was broken-hearted over Ann Romney. He was in the hospital in France because he crashed a car in 1968, which killed a woman. The car accident killed a woman. And Mitt Romney, actually, it was unclear whether he was even going to survive it. It's unclear. As we know, there's very little information. What's, what's the right word? There is speculation, even though Mitt Romney's religion forbids him to drink, whether he may have been under the influence, we don't know. There is not a record of that. There are actually surprisingly few records about this accident. And that's, that's the joke. That's the Ann Romney joke. Now, the comparison would be, the, the question, we were talking about this yesterday, Lewis, actually. Uh, is this relevant to Mitt Romney's presidency? Is this re relevant to Mitt Romney as a president? No, this has no bearing on Mitt Romney as a president. That, that's, that's correct. It talks a lot about Ann Romney's character. Now, here's the equivalent. And the equivalent is what? You know what I'm getting to. 
Chappaquiddick, and Ted Kennedy. Would it be relevant if Ted Kennedy were alive today, uh, or at any point, to make the Chappaquiddick incident a, uh, a political issue? And I would say, no, it's not about that. That's not the right comparison. The comparison would be if Ted Kennedy's wife were to go on a show like The View and to joke around about how, oh, you know, it's funny, Ted's good at swimming, uh, getting out of cars and swimming, ha 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 ha. Or actually, Ted has some experience swimming drunk, ha 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 ha. That would be very, very offensive, and it would really, to me, say a lot about who we're looking at as a potential first lady here. That's the comparison. The comparison to, it, is it relevant about Mitt Romney as a politician? I agree it's not. But this is a very in poor taste joke to be making. And I guarantee you, if everybody in the audience knew what the joke was alluding to, they're not going to be happy, Lewis. Uh, maybe not. Is it possible that she just didn't really think about what she was saying? Or is this... Is that an excuse? I don't know. Could be. I don't think it's an excuse. No? If you're so callous that you don't even realize that that's an offensive joke to be making, that's a bigger problem. That's, a, that's an even bigger problem. And then here's the other part talking about Whoopi Goldberg asking her about uh, did your kids serve, they didn't serve, their religion, their missions, whatever. And Ann Romney, again, making the comparison that Mitt Romney has made, that their service to Mormonism and to Mitt Romney's campaigns are, are equivalent to serving in the military. Take a listen. Um, but the, the thing that I love, and I will tell you this, that m when I have these boys, you all know as mothers, um, that when you're raising children, that one of the most selfish periods in their life is about 18, 19, 20. <laughs> Where, that's, it, that's it? Well, well, maybe there's longer than that, longer. but they're pretty selfish during that time. And my boys um, all did serve missions, and they went away for two years. And I sent them away boys. And they came back men. Right, just like the and military. And what the difference was, and I think this is where military service is so extraordinary too, where you literally do something where you're helping someone else. You're going outside of yourself and you're working and helping others. And that changes you. It changes you. And, you know, this so... This is disgusting. Not only is she... She's actually doing the opposite. She's not saying that... Mormonism is like military service. She's actually saying the opposite, that this is really all about Mormon mission. And military service kind of, you know, if I have to include it, it kind of has some of the same components of really helping people and, open, you know, turning boys into men and blah, 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 blah. I'm sick of it. And if, if, I'm, if, I'm a, if I was, were an, an army vet, a military vet, and I'm not, if I were in the military and I'm not, I would be incredibly offended by this. The idea that sending Mitt off, in this case, it's Mitt's kids, but Mitt did this too. Going off during the Vietnam War, uh, avoiding having to go fight in the war that you publicly, vocally are in favor of. and Proselytizing. Hanging, proselytizing. Hanging around in France and proselytizing. And that that's equivalent to, to what it's like to be in the military. In other words, Mitt Romney's experience of, of proselytizing in France during the Vietnam War is the same as if he had been fighting in that war. It's, it's disgusting and it's ridiculous. It's completely offensive. And I, I can't understand why a single member of the military would vote for, for Mitt Romney and, uh, and would not find this absolutely disgusting. I find this despicable. I find proselytizing to also to be completely despicable. So this is a double whammy. There's a, well, there's a double. Yeah. The Fox News psychiatrist story. Last week, we had the story about Dr. Keith Ablo, who went on Fox News, a psychiatrist, and he said, well, based on Joe Biden laughing during the vice presidential debate, I think I wouldn't rule out the possibility of dementia or that he had been drinking, both incredibly offensive, one based on laughing, the other offensive because, as we know, uh, jo uh, Joe Biden's uh, first wife and a daughter that he had were killed by a drunk driver, so incredibly offensive. Now, I got an email from Ben saying, how is it different if Fox News has a psychiatrist on to analyze Joe Biden and diagnose him with potential dementia than if David Pakman has an expert on sociopathic behavior come on and analyze Mitt Romney and says Mitt Romney's a sociopath. Let's talk about this. Let's get into this because there are a number yeah. of differences here. Oh, yeah. Where do you find the differences to be? Uh, first of all, we're not claiming to be uh, professionals of any sort. So and that's if we, if we, when we make, because we yeah. haven't had an expert on to talk about that, but we've discussed and we've right. said this seems sociopathic. Yeah. It's just our take on it. That's, that's what we, and if you look at the clip of this guy, he actually says, now, I didn't actually study the debate and study Joe Biden. But I he, am here as a psychiatrist. He, he says, says he's here as a psychiatrist. He says he didn't even really watch the debate or watch Joe Biden. And he says, oh, well, there might be dementia. He said, no, what he says is he didn't evaluate him in person. Right. 
Right. And he says, we've got to consider d dementia. There's so many issues here. And the other one is that what we're talking about here is based on laughing. When we say, you know, we know that politicians and CEOs tend to have a higher level of sociopathy than the average population. And we're analyzing actions of Mitt Romney's over a long period of time that not in, in the facial expressions, even though that is a part of Mitt Romney's bizarre nature, or, any, any, or laughing. It's really about the things he's done over a long period of time that make us think, given that politicians tend to be high on that scale, I would assume maybe Romney is even higher on that scale. It's very, very different. We're talking about the clinical definition of psychopathy. And it's really, it really encompasses a lot. It doesn't fit with the, the gene generic connotation of when you call someone a psychopath. There's, there's also two other things, which is that psychopathy is a scale in the same way that is narcissism, in the same way that is someone's height. And people are on that scale at different levels. That's very different than a psychiatrist going on and based on a couple of chuckles during a debate saying we may have a, a, a man who is demented, who is suffering from dementia. Right. Very, very different things. Yes. Big difference between saying somebody might have some psychopathic traits and, oh, this man clearly suffers from dementia because I heard him laugh during a debate. Completely different. Completely a irresponsible, too. Absolutely. That's it for this segment, okay? We need to get on to Mike Elk, who's going to talk to us coming up after the break. Facebook.com slash David Pakman Show. Check out our Facebook page. Check out davidpakman.com slash gear for t-shirts like the one Lewis is wearing. Back after this. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Joining me is Mike Elk. He is a labor reporter. He's been covering all aspects of labor in and around the 2012 presidential campaign. Mike, let's talk about this recent leaked audio of Mitt Romney suggesting that people who have businesses should tell their employees uh, how they should vote and that there's nothing illegal about basically making your case for who you think will be better for that company's economic future. Outline for us what are the, what are the laws, what's legal and illegal about implying or telling employees how, to, how they should vote. Yeah, well, first off, what's important to note is that this wasn't leaked audio. I found this on the website of a business lobby group. This is something out in the open uh, that they're advertising. Um, and what's happened is that a result of Citizens United uh, corporations can now talk to their employees about politics. They can even force their employees to volunteer for political candidates, uh, since they're now considered corporate resources and an arm of political free speech. Um, so what's happened is that Citizens United has lifted the previous FEC restrictions that prohibited corporations from talking directly to their employees about politics. Uh, this is obviously troubling, since what Mitt Romney was saying on this conference call is that you should tell your employees that their jobs depend on me being reelected. Uh, obviously, that's a scary threat from a boss. If a boss comes in and says, if you don't reelect me, there's a high likelihood everyone might lose their jobs. A lot of people are going to go ahead and be scared into voting properly. Um, so this is a really scary scenario. In many ways, it's like taking the anti-union union buster playbook and applying it to electoral politics. Okay, so let's talk about the legality. Mitt Romney even getting on the record in that phone call saying, hey, there's nothing illegal about this. What, what is the, where is that line in terms of what is legal and what is not legal? Um, there's no line anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's illegal to force someone to donate to a campaign, but you can still hit your employees up pretty hard over donating. Um, that's the only line. Um, you know, if your boss says to you, hey, we're all going to go phone bank all day for Mitt Romney, you got to do it or your boss can fire you. That's legal under Citizens United. So I was listening to a couple of other programs that were talking about this in the last week or so. And one, at one view on this, and I'm curious to get your thought on it, is that while the employee, employer is protected in terms of what he can say as far as supporting political candidates based on Citizens United, that if the employee can prove, and this is not the easiest thing to prove, but can prove that there was a reasonable fear that they specifically 
would be fired or otherwise reprimanded or pay would be affected by their political decisions, their vote, what have you, that that would actually go beyond Citizens United in a separate, it, you, these cases would be, have, to, have to be made individually, but that there would be something illegal there if the employee was felt coerced into voting. It's a real gray area. Uh, and the matter is that, quite frankly, how many workers are going to want to sue a corporation and fight it out for a year or two in court? Uh, not very much. So while there might be some legal protections, it's a gray area, and not too many folks are willing to go without a job for a year or two when they got mortgage payments and it's tough finding other jobs. No question about it. So what, what can people do? In other words, what should I be saying on our program, which is progressive, which believes that Citizens United was a mistake, right? What, what can the left really do? What, what's the most effective message? Is it that we need to go all the way to a constitutional amendment that will effectively overturn Citizens United, which is a huge task? Are there shorter term things? What about for this particular election? What, what is the message we want to give to these voters who are the subject of these uh, uh, pol of political recruitments as they may be well i think the biggest message is one that uh you know that workers need to talk out about this talk to reporters and let people know maybe not on the record maybe off the record and let them know about this kind of political intimidation so that way we can document it and i think documenting it makes employers less likely to do it that's the short term very short term uh way to deal with it uh, another midterm way to deal with it is quite frankly um the only protection most folks would have against being fired is to be a member of a union. Uh, you know, unions can protect folks in these kind of situations. There's certain clear spelled out terms in union contracts for why people can be fired. Um, and so I think that's the biggest solution. Uh, number three, I think certainly uh, we have to overturn Citizens United, a constitutional amendment of some variety. So I think these are the, uh, the big things that people could be doing. Let's talk a little bit about also, you know, you said would, a, would an individual really want to sue a company over their belief they may be coerced in terms of their voting because then it could be a year or two in court you've got mortgage payments to make does that same logic apply a lot of the times with what with why there is not more uh, uh, movement towards union organization in some of these companies i mean it's the same type of thing right you, you don't want to be the one that stands out and even though legally you can't be fired for looking to create a union we know that your employer can make life pretty difficult for you can't they yeah, oh yeah, they can make life extremely difficult for you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's a real problem uh, how much they can make the life difficult and all these kind of things. So, you know, and I think most folks aren't even well educated enough to realize that they have these options to speak out and do these other things. All right, so bottom line, there really is nothing illegal about what Mitt Romney said. There was nothing illegal about Congressman Joe Walsh standing up there in a bar and saying, hey, all of you with businesses, Tell your employees, if you don't vote for Romney, things are going to get bad. You might lose your job. It's all perfectly legal under the current system. That's right. Scary. Incredible. Really. Absolutely incredible. We've been speaking with labor reporter Mike Elk. Check him out online on the web. Uh, great to talk to you as always, Mike. Great to talk to you too. Okay, thanks. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. This program is mostly funded by individual members. Please consider an individual membership, particularly now where we don't know what the results of the next election will be, but in either case, we're going to need alternative to corporate media. If Mitt Romney wins the next election, we are really going to need alternatives to corporate media to put together the stories about actual people, not corporate driven news we're going to need true progressive media outlets if president obama wins we're really going to need true progressive media outlets to actually push the president to be as progressive as possible because we, as we know lewis if it depended on the corporate media who just want to push the two-party horse race essentially and not really have any change we're not going to get very far so please consider a david pakman show member i can't think of a, of a more important time for strong independent media it is it is a must the more the better. 
update on my speeding ticket hearing. Several months ago, I got a speeding ticket on the way to the studio. I believe that the speeding ticket was incorrect. I don't believe that either uh, the speed was measured accurately or it was even my car that was measured. I don't know what happened. So I appealed the ticket and I sent in a list of items, which I have here that I wanted in terms of uh, uh, documentation so I could research the, the details of that speeding ticket. I, was, I assumed I would either get those documents in the mail or I wouldn't. Turns out I was scheduled for a hearing before a clerk magistrate today. So I actually went today. I had my hearing. I had my day in court, as they say, Lewis, where I would make the case that I need these documents here. A number of these were accepted. A couple were not. So I went up there. They made me wait until the very last person, uh, about an hour and 20 minutes, I assume because they find this incredibly annoying and they want to deal with five minute dismissal or not dismissal and I was there to request documents. I went in there. The clerk magistrate basically just said, so I have your letter requesting these documents. Um, let's go through them. And he just started going through them. The, the key is I want the notes. You know how the, there's the speeding ticket and you get a copy of the speeding ticket. Immediately after, on the back, on a page that you don't get, the officer writes a bunch of notes, like for example, heavy traffic, light traffic, all sorts of different things. And I need those notes because I need to know what kind of an argument to make when I go in there. If, if, the, if I'm going to go in there and saying, he must have been, it must have been a different car, and it says there was absolutely no traffic on the road at this time, that's going to be a tough argument to make. So that's just a key thing. I've got to have that right. absolutely clerk magistrate making it available to me. Good start, right? Good start, yeah. Okay, so then I asked for the training records of the officer on the LIDAR unit that was used to measure my speed. I asked for a certificate that that particular device had been calibrated properly. I asked for the operator's manual for that device because we need to make sure that not only is the officer trained on it and that it's calibrated, but that he's using it in the way that the actual manufacturer of the LIDAR unit believes it should be used. All pretty reasonable stuff, right? Right. So that was all good. The one that they said no go on was I wanted the patrol car assignments for that day. And the reason I wanted that was if, for ex if the officer that pulled me over decided on his own, well, let, let's go back. If he was assigned to be sitting at that, that particular location doing radar that day, that's one thing. If he decided on his own to start doing that, then I would have a number of questions. Like, for example, what made him pick that spot to park? Uh, what was the prevailing speed limit at the time? How long did he actually sit there and measure speeds before he pulled me over? Was I the, the first car that went by? Was I the 10th car, the 100th car? How long was he sitting there? They said, no, I'm not going to get that. And uh, I've I, I actually asked, I was like, well, can I make a case for that? And the guy said, no, I'm not admitting it. And I said, okay, very good. Thank you. So mm -hmm, all in all, wow. five out of seven I got. The other one that was a no is just one that was a duplicate. He said, I'm kind, you're kind of already getting this. So Five out of seven is really not bad. I feel like I'm going to have some good documentation here. I will build my case. Now, I do have to play this voicemail. I made a joke about Mark Garagos and Gloria Allred representing me for the speeding ticket. It was an obvious joke. Someone didn't think so, and they left me this voicemail. Take a listen to this, Lewis. Yeah, it's Total Control 871 coming out of New Jersey. Okay. David, I want to talk about the video clip you just did with the uh, officer calling in about your speeding ticket and yeah. what to do. Uh, you're hiring a, a lawyer, am I, am I understanding this correct? And you're trying to hire what I take it very expensive lawyers. Wow, I must have been one hell of a bar mitzvah. I mean, how much are you packing, dude? Okay, uh, so first of all, it was an obvious joke that I was hired. Mark Garagos is a celebrity defense attorney. He's not coming to Massachusetts. He's not going to traffic court with me. That's number one. Anybody should be able to realize that. Number two, there's some anti-Semitic undertones here. What, if, if a Jew hires a lawyer, he clearly got the money from a bar mitzvah? I mean, what, what are we talking about here, Natan? I think we're talking about textbook anti-Semitism. <laughs> I think that's what we're talking about. I don't <laughs> think it even needs uh, explaining. It's just the oldest uh, comment in the book. That, that's it, right? We don't even need to go further into it. Maybe just, uh, maybe just a bad joke. I don't know. I, I hadn't, by, and I didn't even have a bar mitzvah. That's, that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the, the cherry on top, so to speak. None of us did here. Yeah, it's true. Right. Yeah. Very, very true. So anyway, no. Um, uh, unlike whatever ideas you have about where Jews get money, um, I'm not hiring an attorney. And if I did, the few times I have hired an attorney, it did not come out of my bar mitzvah money. I guess it's good to make that clear on the show because not everybody knows that. That's good. Thank you, David. Incredible story of uh, election fraud here in Massachusetts, literally right down the road from us in East Long Meadow. There's an, a former East Long Meadow selectman named Enrico Villameno 
who was arrested in a voter fraud scandal. And the way this went down is unbelievable. Villameno was against, uh, pitted against Longmeadow Republican Mary Angelides in a state primary. That's a, a Republican primary for state representative, okay? And the campaign completely imploded. This individual, I'm, I'm kind of summarizing here, and I'm, I'm talking from my experience, talking to local people who know about this story. This individual decided that he was going to take it upon himself to change the registrations of a number of voters. And he was going to, um, a, a large number of residents changed party affiliation from Democratic to Independent, which made them eligible to vote in the upcoming Republican primary. It's surmised that Mr. Villameno did this with then the intention of making those people vote Republican. It was mostly older people. They all came from certain streets, certain neighborhoods. And he said, you know, it, it seems that last time, I guess he lost by about 250 votes. Looks like he did this with about 280 votes. Number one, this is really stupid because you're going to get caught. But number two, you would think that maybe you need more than a 30 vote margin because a lot of things could change since the last one of these. And maybe, maybe risking the jail time for only a 30 vote cushion is not really very smart. Now here's the incredible thing. He was working with this other woman in all this. It appears that it was, a, I, I forget whether it was his intern or assistant or something like that. It was someone working on his behalf. And she, of course, was going to be asked to testify against him. So what did he do to prevent her from testifying? He married her. Wow. They are now married because you can't, you can't be compelled to testify against your spouse. Allegedly, from what I'm told from people who know the situation on the ground, this guy actually has a girlfriend. Like, in other words, not this new wife. He's in a real relationship. This is just a fake, it's, it's a real marriage, but it, the, the reasons for it are not love. Let's put it that way. It's to prevent testifying. Unbelievable story of Republican vote election fraud right down the road from us. I mean, literally 20 minutes from us. Winner. This guy is a winner. Unbelievable. Let's get to your voicemails and emails. The voicemail line, open 24 hours a day, 219-2-DAVID-P. Here is one voicemail. Let's take a listen. Hey, David, Lewis, and Guatam. Um, it's Matt from Canada. We Canadians have been closely watching the upcoming American election, and I really enjoyed watching President Obama suplex Mitt Romney in the latest debate. The one thing that was kind of weird, though, both Obama and Romney have been talking about leprechauns and unicorns. No, wait. No, it wasn't leprechauns and unicorns. Something else entirely fictional. Clean coal. Sorry, clean coal. Yeah, that was it. My mistake. <laughs> Not leprechauns. And unicorns, clean coal. Right, yeah, we talked about this, which is talking about clean coal is, is you're talking about something that doesn't exist. It is a, essentially a unicorn. Yeah. Uh, or, I mean, it, it could be when you actually take a lump of coal and try to clean it yourself. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's as close as we'll get to clean coal. It would be clean in the colloquial sense, I guess. Right. Incredible. Yeah, mm -hmm. the clean coal comments. We'll see if those come up, come up again. On the McDonald's owner refusing to turn off Fox News in his restaurant. There's nothing to discuss, really. McDonald's is a place of business. If they think it's good for their business to show people uh, getting killed on TV and lying in the pool of blood while someone eats a ketchup meal, that's their business. As a customer, you choose which companies you want to support. End of story. Basically, my view. Nothing can say. If he, that's what he wants on TV, that's what he has on TV. You don't have to go there. I wouldn't anyway. I haven't been to McDonald's in close to 15 years at this point. And I don't have a problem with Fox News or any network showing a suicide. What's the matter, people? Did the knowledge of people committing suicides shatter your perfect world illusion? Well, you know what they say, ignorance is bliss. Fair enough, but in a McDonald's, I don't know if that's appropriate. And yeah, lastly, go ahead. the gentleman who visited the restaurant has every right to tell the guy to turn it off, but making a huge deal out of it is absolutely childish. Yeah. Well, we're talking about a McDonald's here, a restaurant that caters to, to children uh, above all else and it is just very irresponsible to be playing something like that in your restaurant regardless of your political views I mean are you actively trying to sway people who enter your restaurant by playing Fox News into voting for Mitt Romney I mean are you watching it actively while running this busy restaurant it looked like this guy was I mean when the, in the video where he's caught where the guy talks to him he's sitting there watching the TV oh well can you just put it on one TV or is that all in <laughs> I don't know we don't know. In any case, certainly legal to do anything you want. I certainly would not patronize a business that uh, watches has Fox News on, and I also wouldn't go to McDonald's. So it's unlikely you'll see me at this location anytime soon. Please get the bonus show, davidpackman.com slash membership. You'll be helping to support the show. You will be a member, and you will get that great bonus show, which is hosted and produced by producer Lewis Motomedy. That's it for today. We'll see you tomorrow. Brand new show, great interviews, a lot of great stories. 
Lewis will be here. Natan will be here. Guatam will be here. Everybody will be here. We'll see you tomorrow afternoon. David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.